Hello, and thank you for joining the Brian Hornback Experience. This is episode 91, and I've got another candidate that's running for public office. It's a candidate running for state senate in District 5, and that is none other than Kent Morrell, Republican candidate uh, for state senate. Kent, how are you this morning? Oh, absolutely! Hey, uh, we'll get started because um, you, you, and you and your opponent both spoke at the West Knox Republican Club um, about a week ago. Um, Might have been this past Monday. I, I don't, I don't remember. Anyway, you spoke um, the second Monday of June, which would have been the thirteenth uh, at the West Knox Republican Club. You spoke, uh, and and that for folks that want to see that, that's up on my YouTube, and it's up on a a uh, blog post at brianhornback.com so people can go and and so I'm first of all I want to apologize Kent because I remember you running for the US Senate a couple years ago and and all all I, re I remember seeing you a couple times granted as you said you know you had to travel from Murfreesboro to Bristol um so you know granted you weren't in Knoxville a lot although you are in Knoxville you. but all I really remembered from that was that you were for cannabis but you've got a compelling story that I learned on June the 13th about why you support cannabis. So anyway, to kind of get started, one of, first of all, I want to say that until Monday, June the 13th, I didn't know your story. So let's kind of get into that. Um, we're, I'm going to give your, your web address, um, both your Senate, your, your on Facebook. We'll give all that too. But just to get folks started, you're from Knox County. You've been married for a number of years. You got four adult children. You just kind of give us the, the kind of thing, and then and then you can go ahead and kind of start about what happened in 2000, and then 2015. All right. Well, well I'll try the short version. Then Absolutely. Right. You're right. Thirty minutes is kind of right. Kind of short for a twenty-year-old story. Oh, I know. I know. I, I get it. All right. So I'm originally from Bristol. Came to UT. Graduated high school in 88, came to UT in 88, loved Knox and ended up staying. My girlfriend at the time from high school, she came the next year. So we got married in 90, um, had four kids, started the business, things were going great. I was in a car accident on September 22nd, 2000. It was my son's third birthday, mm -hmm. um, Friday afternoon, last run of the day on a small business I mentioned. Right. Um, so I got. On a, on a side road out in West Knoxville, it had rained just a little bit that afternoon, and this this person was coming down the hill, and and uh, I noticed I had about two seconds to look to my left and noticed she had locked her brakes up coming down this hill, and she T-boned me about forty miles an hour. Wow! And I had just I had just enough time to to say oh crap and and tense up and grab my steering wheel as tightly as I could, which was the worst thing I could have done. Uh, the impact ripped the thoracic muscles on both sides of my spine. My thoracic spine because I was holding on so tightly to the steering wheel. Mm. They, uh, the police officer at the time that responded told my wife he's hurt worse than he knows. He needed to get him to the hospital, and I, I didn't want to go. I had I had stuff I needed to do. We had a birthday party for my son scheduled later that day. Well, the pain started showing up about later that evening, and I finally went to it. I didn't go to the emergency room. Went to an after hours clinic. And the doctor said, uh, "Well, you're you're probably gonna you probably have some soft soft, soft tissue injuries. You're, you're probably gonna hurt for, for six weeks." Wow. Um, uh, six weeks? I don't have time for six weeks. Of course, I didn't realize that that was putting me on a path for almost 19 years of severe suffering. So they, they started giving me a few weeks to rest and told me I needed physical therapy. And if the medical community tells you something, you're gonna believe them. Right. So I, I started physical therapy. Did, physical therapy for um, head major surgery in 2001 um, did uh, another year of physical therapy and uh, wait the surgery was in 2002 sorry so two years of physical therapy then the major surgery I had so many surgeries it's kind of right. track out. wow so finally in 2000 at the end of 2002 when the major surgery didn't work and the physical therapy wasn't helping they finally told me they diagnosed me with permanent nerve damage to my thoracic spine, and, the, and they, they finally said, and what the doctor actually said was, it's time to realize this is permanent, adjust your love accordingly. Huh. Well, my wife is a stay-at-home mom. 
long when we had four kids in private school. And, and I had already started losing customers because I couldn't take care of my customer base like I needed to. Right. So by the, by, by the time they, and they kept telling me for two years, you'll get better, you'll get better. And, and I, I believed them, I figured I'd get better. Well, that meant that my wife was going to have to get a job and we're going to have to pull the kids out of private school. And we ended up selling our house and moving into the cars area. We were closer into town uh, where we were. Put our kids in cars schools and that that began well, from this point from 2002 to, to 2019 i mean that was 16 and a half 17 years of just trying to make it till tomorrow because my only goal at this point i was in so much pain was just to survive until tomorrow i i stopped thinking about the future i mean my life was falling apart because the three was correct right, right. Well, fast forward, I had an experimental surgery in 2005 um, called radiofrequency ablation. And this is, they use it for treating cardiac issues. Well, they started using it to, to break the pain signal in your medial branch. That's mm. an entirely different discussion. But it wasn't a permanent thing. But I got part of my life back with that and was able to start working again, start growing my company again. But I only got about six months of relief from that. So I had to have multiple procedures of this so over the next eight years because insurance required a test procedure so over the next eight years i had 52 surgical procedures on my spine wow and then you know with the affordable care act that that wiped all that away i didn't get to keep my doctor i didn't get to keep my plans you know surprise surprise someone from the other party lied to us <laughs> right so anyway Insurance stopped approving the procedures that worked in 2013. And uh, I, you mentioned, I'm going to get to the cannabis part. Right, right. Part of my issue was I don't process medications correctly. Right. And my doctors didn't believe that until I woke up in the middle of one of my surgeries when I was supposed to be fully sedated. Wow. And this was been in 2007 or 8 when they started paying attention and actually making sure I was getting any relief. But I finally had genetic testing done that showed scientifically why I do not process medications correctly. You have a, a system in your liver called the cytochrome P450 system where 90% of the medications you take are processed through that system. And there's there's eight enzymes they can test now, and they all affect how your body absorbs medications. Some people too fast, some people too slow. And, and most people, fortunately, are, are, are average. That's why everything's based on what works for most people. Right. Well, the state in there uh, had the genetic testing done, went to a new group, got my pain level under control, but it was a, an in, a politically incorrect amount of medication. Uh, and the state thought that doctors writing prescriptions were contributing to overdoses, and the state decided to repeal an act called the Interactive Pain Care Act that protected doctors and patients that treated people like me, hmm. patients like me. And that's when I got involved in politics because I knew that was going to start personally affecting me. Well, I didn't realize how bad it was going to affect me. I, I started going down the national and making calls and talking to my opponent, Dr. Briggs, about what was happening to patients. And it, it was like talking to a brick wall. Nothing changed. Nothing moved anybody. And sure enough, in 2017, I was in a different group. It was a lot more restrictive. Get drug tested every 28 days pill counts. I mean, it's, you wonder if you're in a role and you're just trying to function. And this is what's happening to pain patients. This is 2017, 2018. Well, my doctor started pushing an implantable pain pump on me, and I had already been evaluated for one of those. And the reason he was pushing it was because it looks like a small amount of medicine, but it's going directly into your epidural space. And so you get great pain relief from that. But the only reason he wanted me to, to do that was because, as he said, the amount of medication he was writing me increased the, the average of his entire group. And it was painting a target on his back. And he was afraid the state was going to come in and, and audit him and shut him down. And I, I understand it now, but at the time, yeah, because I mean, him, him treating me was affecting his 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 ability to to function and make a make an income. That's what he was worried about. If he could contribute, if he continued to treat me with the medicine I needed. He might lose his practice completely. So fear makes you do terrible things. And uh, I think he feared the government. So I turned down the pain pump for, for four months. I 
showed up for an appointment uh, in March of, of 2018. They hand me a letter that says I'm being dismissed as a patient due to irregularities on my drug screen. Wow. They wouldn't give me a copy of it, wouldn't give me any more information, and I was somewhat upset about that because, you know, this is my lifeline. I, I had to live my life in 28-day segments because that's when my prescriptions were written. So I knew life was going to get very hard on me. Oh, well, what? Well, they wouldn't give me a copy of it. I went immediately to my primary care doctor, asked him to run a drug test. He did. It was clean. Yeah, it was clean. Yep. Well, the medicine I had been prescribed was right. in my system. There, right. there was nothing illegal in my system. And so my, my primary care doctor started requesting my medical records. Well, by law, you're supposed to send those within 30 days. Well, they didn't send it for six months. Because wow. Because what was not included in my medical records, that drug screen. But they just dismissed me because he didn't want to treat me anymore, and I wouldn't go along with playing his game of having invasive surgeries just because it's good for him. Because he because he feared because because he feared the regulators and which I E is the government, right? Exactly. Right. And, this, and in this case, he was fearing the state government. He was very specific right. about that. Right. Because the state made changes to pain management that that affects Tennesseans. They don't even know that it's affecting them. Ryan, did you know that? Vanderbilt had a, had a world-renowned class of neurosurgeons that left the state of Tennessee because they could no longer adequately treat post-procedure pain. That I, happened in 2018. I did not know that. So we're losing doctors, world-class doctors, because the state is so restrictive on, on pain medicine now that people can't get the, the appropriate treatment they need. Matter of fact, when my mother had knee replacement three years ago, they gave her Tylenol for post-procedure pain after she left the hospital. Got violently ill, almost killed her. She was 83 years old. She's 86 now. Thank God she's still around. But no patient should have to, to go through problems like that. Right. So anyway, 2018, it was March 27th. You remember those important days that my doctor dropped me. Right. My oldest daughter was was graduating, flight attendant training for American, for a major airline two days later. So we flew to Dallas for that. And I started cutting my medicine because... I knew I wasn't going to get any more, and I decided we had two daughters getting married. I had my second daughter getting married in April, and my third daughter getting married in June. And probably my only goal was to make it through those weddings, and then then I was going to decide what to do after that. Well, got through the weddings. After the June wedding, we we got home, and I, I stopped the last of my medicine, and, and the, the pain came back with a vengeance. The withdrawal was horrendous. I developed anxiety and panic attacks and depression that almost killed me. Excuse me. And I told my wife in June, I said, I said, baby, I'm, I've got a ton of life insurance. And I think I'm done with this. I'm, I'm tired of suffering. I'm tired wow. of fighting this fight. And I was talking about suicide. And uh, my, my wife did not appreciate that. She, uh, she, she did not appreciate that at all. She said, baby, I didn't marry you for your money, which is a good thing because we didn't have much. Right. She said, also have not gone through 18 years of misery and suffering with you for you to give up now. You better find a way to make it through this. So I thought, I thought about as a parent of a, someone working at a major airline, I, we could have flown anywhere in the world for about 50 months each. And I thought about going to Europe to try a treatment that's available there that is not available here. And uh, I realized if I do and it works, I, I can't come home and, uh, I'm not going to use street crap. I'm just, I'm not going to use illegal. Right. You know, heroin and stuff like that. Right. And a friend of mine said, he said, Kent, before you leave the country, why don't you try the local option? And he was talking about cannabis. And I laughed because I thought, there's no way cannabis is going to touch my kind of pain. It's just not. That's, and I had been advocating for treatment options already and had been meeting people in Nashville that cannabis had worked for. So I thought, well, maybe I should try this because I'm, I'm seeing some impressive things from advocates down in Nashville. But sure enough, this friend worked with me for, it was several months. We tried different strains, different delivery methods, um, different timing, and it was microdosing is what it's called. It's, you use an oil-based canvas oil. Um, you dose it every three hours or however often that works for you. <clears throat> and that's what started getting my life back. But I went through a time for about 90 days in 2019 or 2018, uh, I didn't expect to see 2019. I was much. I think I was going to make it. Right. There were about 90 days, starting in September, where it was a breath-by-breath breath decision. 
to take the next breath. That's how awful wow. it was. I mean, I just can't express to you how bad suffering can be when you don't have access to treatment options. And it was, it was awful, man. I, I, I have new respect for people that deal with anxiety and depression. Um, I used to think physical pain was the worst thing you could experience. And it's not. I'm just going to tell you, severe anxiety, severe depression happens inside your head and you can't get away from it. At least the pain in my spine was 12 inches away from my brain. And it gave me just a bit of separation. But man, that battle going on in your head, I have new respect for people that deal with, with anxiety and depression. So wow. there, there were people I went to and apologized for dismissing their issues with anxiety and depression after I had gone through it. And it, it's sad to say that, but I think most people don't have a clue how bad things can be until you've gone through it yourself. Right. Uh, let me take a breath here. Yeah. Um, uh, all right. So I finally get into 2019. I'm coming out of this misery. Um, I, I'm starting to function again, getting some of my life back. Well, on Memorial Day of 2019, after 18 years, 8 months, and 5 days, I woke up without pain on Memorial Day of 2019. Wow. That's 1,120 days ago. I think that's my count. I didn't check yesterday. Once right. you get over about 1,000 bonus days, you come to yeah, count very Yeah, exactly. But I, I do count my days now, and I, I try to take advantage of every opportunity I have because I, I didn't think I was going to get a second chance at living. And and here I, I've got a second chance. Wow. And I tell friends, I wonder what Lazarus did with his second life. Mm. I would love to have a book of Lazarus just to know what he did with his second life. Well, getting into the summer of 2019, we, we start making up for lost time. If, you know, if, if you haven't been able to do fun things for, for almost 20 years, you, you cram as much life as you can in when you get your life back. Right. So we, we got more done around the house in the first 19 days than we had the previous 19 years. We went to the beach five times over that summer. Hmm. Uh, I've got family that lives in Charleston and we went to Florida too. Man, I just we just cramped making up for lost time in the end of the summer. And by, awesome. When August came around, I thought, man, maybe this is going to be a long term thing. Maybe I maybe I can start thinking about the future. So for almost 19 years, I mentioned this. My only goal was to survive until tomorrow. If you're if you're in the middle of awful suffering, you do not have the luxury of planning for your future. You right, don't. right. It's depressing to think. It, it was depressing to me to think this is my life, the suffering every day without adequate relief. And that, that's a hard thing to, to cope with if you're, you know, at, let's say I was 30, 31 years old. When, wow. When that accident happened. Yeah. Um, so I started thinking about the future, and I started thinking somebody needs to do something about this. It, it, it disturbed me that I was able to replace almost 500 milligrams of morphine a day, my sleep aids, antidepressants, muscle relaxers, with cannabis. Wow. With something that you can literally throw seeds out, and it will grow. It's called weeds for a reason, because it's so easy to grow. So it, 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 it irritated me that the state of Tennessee put me in a position where my only choices were suicide or illegal treatment. Right? Mm, no yeah. Tennesseans should be put in a position where their only choices are killing themselves or, or breaking the law. And I hate to say it, it was a big decision for me to break the law. That was how big of a rule follower I was. I was brought up in the church. I believed the lies my whole life that cannabis was bad. That's what we were told. That's what we were taught. Well, if you go back and look at the history of how cannabis was made illegal to start with, it was a racist, progressive move to marginalize a community and, and promote big business. Hmm. I mean, cannabis, I mean, it's hip. Randolph Hearst owned a media empire. He wanted his magazines and newspapers to be printed on the timber that he owned in the Pacific Northwest. He didn't want competition from him. And then you have Harry Azinger, who was the, the attorney general in the U.S. when well, he was married into the DuPont family. Nylon, hemp is a competitor, a competitor against nylon. It was big business, and then you had big pharma. You know, right. don't forget that cannabis was used as a, a mainstream medication for 86 years, from the 1850s until 1936 when it finally got outlawed. Hmm. And they, they, they made it a racist issue by calling it marijuana. That was a Mexican, racist slang Mexican term for, for cannabis. They just changed the name of it. Cannabis and marijuana are the exact same thing. And I've had, I've had conversations with state reps and senators that literally thought there was a difference between, I had one tell me once, well, I'm, I'm pro-cannabis.
cannabis, but I'm anti-marijuana. Huh. And I said, it's the same thing. And, and the look on, after, after we talked, the look on his face of disgust that he had been lied to, that there was a difference, he got it. So, I mean, right now, Big Pharma is, Big Pharma is in the business of, of creating customers. They're not in the business of creating cures. And we have turned our healthcare business in, in industry over to Big Pharma and Big Insurance, where we are the commodity that they are used to, to make money on. So, so in, so in 2015, um, this act that Dr. Briggs, um, I mean, you were, you were face to face as was you and Dr. You and Dr. Briggs, um, were both at that meeting on the 13th of June and there was about 30 other people there, but, but, but you looked at him and you said, you know, you voted to repeal the act in 2015. Um, so obviously, since 2015, you've been advocating, I, th I think, for an organization called Safe Access Tennessee. That's correct. So, they, they, how, they how, invited me to be a board member right. back in 2017, and been working with them since. Then. Right. So, so how have those conversations with, with now your opponent, gone over the last several years? I mean, obviously, he's a medical doctor, and and you know, you obviously had some experience, but has he been receptive? Um, to the things that you've talked about, um, how, how I'll tell you where he stands on this, and I've had many discussions with him, talked to him for many, many hours. Right, we had a meeting back in February that went almost it was three hours and 40 minutes. So, here's what, here's what Dr. Briggs will say he will say, I believe it needs to go through the FDA approval process, we need to know how it works. Well, there are no known overdoses to cannabis use. I mean, if you use too much cannabis, you're going to feel awful, go to bed, you're going to sleep it off. You're not going to die. You're not going to get brain damage. There are no known... There's no, there, 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 there's right. no known overdoses, right? Right. No known overdose deaths. Now, you can you can take too right. much. Right, right. But there's no known overdose. So, right. Dr. Briggs will say, this should go through the FDA approval process. Well, let me say this now. Somebody's going to say... Well, you're just going negative against Dr. Briggs. Well, Dr. Briggs has said these things. I'm not going negative. I'm right. just talking completely about his record. Right. Uh, you know, these are things he said. This is his voting record. So, so Dr. Briggs will say, you know, FDA approval process for this. Well, if you talk to him long enough, he will brag about having never written a prescription for Oxycontin. Mm. That is, that's an opioid pain medication, long acting. Well, he'll brag about that. Well, Oxycontin is an FDA approved medication. So while he's saying on one hand he thinks cannabis should have to go through the FDA approval process, well, apparently he doesn't trust it because he brags about having not written a prescription for an FDA approved medication. So I see some hypocrisy there. You know, but, and one more thing, Brian, do you know how many FDA approved medications have been pulled from the market just in the last 10 years? Um, I'm sure there's been, I'm sure there's more than a hundred, more than a hundred and probably more than a thousand, but I'm guessing. Uh, 13, almost 13,000. Wow. Um, so people people think that the FDA approval process means the medication is safe. That does not mean that at all. I mean, they don't put medicines out on the market. Like I took Biox many years ago. That was an anti-inflammatory. Turns out it can cause heart problems. You know, right? That's one of those things that would be good to know. Uh, that wow, you know, this FDA approval medication can cause heart problems. Well, that's a stall tactic for Dr. Briggs. He just doesn't want to approve it. Because it's it's illegal at the federal level. That's another one of his issues. It remains Schedule One at the federal level, and he he believes. I, I, I'm very thankful for Dr. Briggs' service sure. in, in the military, but I I think he believes what the government tells him. Number one, and I think he's used to doing what the government tells him to do. Right. So what? And that is, right. And and we're about, we're about five minutes out from the thirty minute cutoff, but I do want to talk about. I mean. Uh, I think I think we've got we've gotten your story again. We, we, you know we've got that story up. So you know there's some other things. I mean obviously healthcare reform is number one on, on your agenda uh, when you're the next state senator um, for the seventh district. I think I said district five, but it's actually district seven. My bad. Um, but you've also uh, some other things that that you you want to do as the next state senator from district seven. I'm sure the lieutenant governor is going to be mad that I identified the district as five, but whatever. Uh, parental parental rights, tax relief, fiscal responsibility, education. Obviously you're pro life and you're a second you're a second amendment guy. So you're you're Republican. I mean, Second Amendment's a no brainer. 
pro-life's a no-brainer. Um, you know, parental rights. I mean, I mean, I think you know you you talked about that in the in the um, in the video I've got up on YouTube from June the thirteenth, where you talk about um, where you did talk about um, where you had contacted it to get permission in order to take uh, the the COVID vaccine, which you didn't want to do, but but there was some some parent, not not parental consent, but there was some informed consent there. So to kind of talk about. As far as education, obviously your kids were in private school, but because of life happened and and some other things, they went into public school. So, are you a are you a pro public school guy? Are you a are, are you an advocate advocate for charters? Are you an advocate for vouchers? Just in about I'm, go ahead. I'm an advocate for options. I okay. Think, I think parents ought to have options if it's vouchers, if it's charter schools, but I'm, I'm for what's best for students. I, I think anytime you have a government monopoly on anything, it's a bad idea. I, I think competition is best in all in all areas. Uh, so yes, I'm, I'm open to. I'm pretty much open to every everything educationally. I, I, I think we need to get away from this corporate model. It doesn't work. It's, you know, right. indoctrinating kids these days. If we just have a few minutes left, the yep. other thing that that here that's frustrated me is, you know, Dr. Briggs sponsored the bill to give half a billion dollars to the Titans. Oh yeah. Um, I'm, I'm anti-cronyism. That's what that is. That's corporate welfare. I'm giving billions to billionaires. I'm sorry, billionaires ought to pay for their own projects. Uh, you know, Tennessee's going to have almost $5 billion in the bank by the end of this summer. And I've, I've even heard Bill Lee talking about all the good things we can do with this money. Well, that's not their money. All right, that's our money. Yeah. If they're if they're collecting that much in revenue, that means they're overtaxing us. They need to be starting cutting taxes. You know, the gas tax would be a great place to start. Dr. Briggs voted for the 2017 Improve Act, and that cut taxes on a few things, but it was the largest gas, in, gas tax increase in state history. So he voted, I, I, I can point you to the numbers, he voted for the largest tax increase in, in, in Tennessee history with the Improve Act, and I'm talking specifically about the gas tax. They'll have almost $900 million collected just from the gas tax this year. Um, wow. The other thing you talk about, parental consent, parental rights. Dr. Briggs sponsored a bill that would have allowed medical professionals to give treatments and vaccines to minors, minor children, without parental consent, like the HPV, the Gardasil vaccine. Uh, that includes uh, emergency use authorized vaccines like the Pfizer shot and things like that. And, and it provided immunity against the people uh, or, or for the people that were given these shots. So I don't think Dr. Briggs believes in parental rights. If you're going to write a bill and sponsor it that takes parental rights off the table, that's a, that's how is that Republican? I mean, tell me how that's Republican. That's that's mm. the definition of Rhino, Republican in name only. He's running as a Republican, but he's he's sponsoring projects for billionaires, sponsoring bills to take away parental rights, voted against con constitutional carry. I mean, there's a number of go to my website. And, right. And, and and, and, uh, yeah, and, and and that website is Kent Morrell for Senate dot com or your personal website is Kent Morrell, K E N T M O R R E L L dot com. But you can also go to Kent Morrell, spelt the same way, F O R S E N A T E dot com. That gets you to the, the campaign website. Um, the, um, there's a link from my right, personal page. Right. There, yeah, you, 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 you can go to Kent Morrell dot com and you can link. Uh, there's a link on there for the Senate page. Also, the Facebook page is Kent Morrell 2020. Obviously, Kent ran. Uh, previously, so that's why that Facebook page is there. But uh, or you can just type in Facebook in the um, in the search Kent Morrell for Senate, and you'll find him there. We got about uh, right at thirty seconds, so I'm going to let you uh, ask for everybody's vote, and, and we may have you back. All right. Well, like Brian said, I am running in the primary against Dr. Briggs for Senate District Seven. I would really appreciate your vote. I think I think I'll do a better job fighting for liberty and freedom in Nashville. Thank you a lot, Kent. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, sir. Uh-huh.